Mark chapter 5. It's kind of an interesting text. And we're dealing with the demonic. And uh, shortly, you know, the disciples and Jesus are just kind of getting together. And, and some things are happening in their ministries. Told a couple of parables. They've had a frightening night on the sea. And Jesus calms the storm. You know that story. And here we come to the fifth chapter of Mark. And it says, And they came to the other side of the sea into the country of ger which he got out of the boat, and immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him any more, even with a chain. And because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the broken shackles in peace, no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs, screaming among the tombs and in the mountains, and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up, he bowed down before him, and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High, I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby the mountain, and the demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what was, what was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and they observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, they became frightened. And those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all that it had all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let them. He said to them, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and he began to proclaim in Decapolis and what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. John Killinger tells this powerful story about a man who was all alone in a hotel room in Canada. And the man was in a state of deep depression. Sometimes we find ourselves in a state of depression. He was so depressed, though, that he could bring himself to go downstairs even to eat breakfast at the restaurant that was there. He was a powerful man. He was the chairman of uh, a large shipping company. But at this moment, he was absolutely overwhelmed by the pressures of life, the demands of life. And he lies there on a lonely hotel bed far away from home, kind of wallowing in his self-pity. And all of his life, he had worried about everything. He was anxious and fretful, and he was always fussing, stewing about every detail. Now in his midlife, his anxiety began to get to him. It got the best of him, even to the extent that it was difficult for him to sleep and, or even to eat. His worries uh, and broods agonized about everything. He uh, about his business, his investments, his decisions, and his family, and his health, and, you know, even his dogs. And then on one day, this, in this Canadian hotel, he, he hits rock bottom. Sometimes we hit rock bottom. And filled with anxiety, completely immobilized, paralyzed by his emotional despair, unable to leave his room, lying on his bed, he moans out loud, Life isn't worth living this way. I wish I were dead. And sometimes some of us feel that way. And then he wonders what God would think if he heard him talking this way. Speaking out loud, he says, God, it's a joke, isn't it? It's a joke. Life is nothing but a joke. And suddenly it occurs to the man that 
This is the first time that he's talked to God since he was a, a little boy. He is silent for a moment, and then he begins to pray, and he describes this prayer like this. I just talked out loud about the mess my life was in and how I tried I, so hard and, and how much I wanted things to be different in my life. And you know what happened next? A voice. I heard a voice. And the voice said, it doesn't have to be this way. That's all. And he writes, he says, I sat up straight, I turned around, I laughed at myself, I thought I must be hearing things, and absolutely certain that I heard these words. It doesn't have to be that way. And he went home, he talked to his wife and about what had happened, he talked to his brother who was a minister, he asked him, do you think it was really God speaking to me? And his brother said, of course, because this is the message of God to you and to everyone, every one of us, Life doesn't have to be that way. And that's the message of the Bible. That's why Jesus Christ came to the world to save us from our sins, to deliver us, to free us, to change us, and to show us it doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to be overcome by anxiety and depression and, and selfishness or hopelessness. Jesus Christ can turn any life, even ours, around if you'll welcome him into your heart and renew that relationship uh, with him. A few days later, the man called his brother and said, you were right. It just happened. I've done it. I've had a rebirth in my life. Christ has turned it around for me. Well, the man, he's still prone to anxiety. Uh, is written and he still has to work hard, but now he has the source of strength to know that it doesn't have to be this way. I can go to God and he will give me the strength that I need. He says, it clears my head. He reminds me of who I am and whose I am. And sometimes I go to the church that's close by. And I think back to the day in that hotel room in Canada and how depressed and lonely and lost I felt. And I hear the voice saying, it doesn't have to be that way. So here in Mark chapter 5, and verses 1 through 20, is precisely the story that is told about the, 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 the demonic who's been tormented. This man's life has had a tormented life. He was possessed. He was a madman uh, whose life was coming apart at the seams. And Jesus, and in this encounter with Jesus turns him around. He gives him a new beginning, a new start, a new birth. And at the beginning of the story, it sounds like a horror story. I mean, here's this wide-eyed, adrenaline-filled madman. He comes running, he's shrieking out of the tomb. I mean, that's pretty scary stuff, isn't it? And he's so unbalanced, he is convinced that he's been held captive by a whole legion of demons who is pulling and jerking him in every direction. This is this eerie, grim, uh, suspenseful, frightening situation that Jesus and his disciples have just come through, through this storm on the Sea of Galilee. And now the nightmare kind of continues as they get out of the boat. It's nighttime. They have survived this frightening storm and they're, they're thrilled to get their feet on solid ground. But as they get out of the boat, they have this encounter, a different kind of storm, another scary experience with this man who is demon-possessed. And we hear strange sounds coming from the tombs. Shrieks and Growls and screams and moans and the rattling of chains. And then suddenly in this horrifying sight, this madman with tattered clothes, bruised and dirty and bloody and, and battered with pieces of chains dangling from his arms and ankles comes running, screaming towards Jesus. Now what would you have done in that situation? It's pretty tough, isn't it? But Jesus stood there and he dealt with this wild man. Jesus healed him. He brought peace to this troubled man. He changed him. He cleansed him. He turned his life around. And Jesus, can, if he can do it to this man, he can do it to any of us at any time. 
when we come encounter with him. This madman is, said his name was Legion. That's a military word, so appropriate for the case because this man was at war. He was at war with himself. Might have had some kind of a mental illness going on. He was at war with other people. And he was at war with God. He was a man that was at war with everybody. His name was Legion. He was doing battle with everybody. But when Jesus walked into his life, in essence, he said to him, it doesn't have to be that way. And in this message we hear today, we have the message that we ourselves can be changed. We can be changed from a life that's maybe not going so great to a life that has meaning and, and purpose. Maybe you, feel, maybe you feel you're at war with yourself. There's some stuff going on and you don't like it. Or you've been through some stuff and you didn't like how you, how you reacted. Maybe you're at war with others. There's conflict in your life. You know, sometimes we have conflict with other people. But the real conflict may come within ourselves. Sometimes we're in conflict with God. God wants us to go be in His will, but we refuse to submit to His will. And so it, it, do you feel like you're being pushed and pulled and jerked and yanked in and, and all these different directions and, and you're just kind of out of control of what's going on? Do you, do you feel like your life is out of balance? It's out of sync, out of sorts, out of step? Do you feel like you're constantly doing battle with everybody that you meet? That life is a war. It's at war. It's overwhelming. It's ripping you apart. Do you feel worn and tired and rejected? And Jesus is saying it doesn't have to be that way. Amen? Ah, oh, man. Amen. Y'all are wearing me out just looking at you. First of all, you don't have to be at war with yourself. You don't have to be at war with yourself. It doesn't have to be that way. Notice here in Mark chapter 5, this madman was at war with himself. He was hurting himself. He was bruising himself. He was injuring himself. How often do we do that? You know, a lot of things that we do in life is self-destructive. It is. It's self-destructive. In our minds, we kind of want to go here, but we're doing stuff that keeps us from going to where we need to go. Sometimes things happen in our life that's so self-destructive that we become depressed and we, be, we, we really just don't like who we are. Someone has said, we have met the enemy. We have met the enemy. And he is us. A lot of truth in that. We've met the enemy. And the enemy's us. One day a young father was shopping in a, in a crowded supermarket and his three-year-old son was with him. The little boy was riding in the grocery cart. And he was misbehaving terribly and everything. every time his daddy would put something in the basket, his son would throw it out. He'd get close to the aisle, he'd just take his arm and knock everything off the shelf. And uh, at one point, the little boy crawled out of the cart. He ran down the aisle, knocking down every display and, that he could get his hands on. His hot father is in hot pursuit. Have you ever seen that scene in some grocery store? Yes. Yeah, it's been there. Yeah. People who were in the store at the time could hear the father saying out loud over and over, just be patient, Tommy. It won't be much longer, Tommy. It'll be okay, Tommy. Hang in there, Tommy. And finally, there was this distinguished looking lady came up to the man and said, I just want to compliment you. I've been watching you. And I want to know that I admire you for your remarkable patience you have with little Tommy. And the lady, the man said, you don't understand. His name's Michael. I'm Tommy. <laughs> That's 
That's, that's a smart man. He was right to start with himself. And if we're going to get a problem right in our life, we're going to have to fix things in our life. We have to get ourselves correct. Right? We have to work on us. There's a young lawyer who came to see his pastor and he was way down the dumps at his wit's end and he said, everything's gone wrong. I've lost confidence in my professional ability. My wife has left me. I can't get along with my children. I cut off my parents and my in-laws. I'm having conflicts with my co-workers. I've been drinking heavily. Everybody has left me. I feel all alone. I don't blame them. I've been bitter. I've been hostile. I've done so many mean and crude things and cruel things that now I have so many problems. He paused and he took a deep breath and he leaned forward and he said, to tell you the truth, I think all those problems and troubles are symptoms and my real problem is that I don't like myself. And that taints everything I touch and do. If you see somebody, I mean, they're just blowing off steam. They're like a volcano. It might be that they don't like themselves. There's a lot of people in this world that don't like themselves. He was probably right. When you're at war with yourself, it smudges, it distorts everything, every relationship that you have. If you're having trouble dealing with other people in your life, it might be because you have a problem. On the other hand, when we feel good about ourselves, we're more loving, we're more patient, we're more thoughtful, we're more gracious toward everyone we see. But we see a lot of bitter people in the world and they don't like themselves. They don't like who they are. They don't like what they've done. And one problem leads to another problem to another problem. And so the question I want to ask you today, do you like who you are? Do you feel good about yourself? Do you like yourself? Do you want to stop bruising and hurting yourself? Do you want to be at peace within yourself? And remember this, you're very special in the eyes of God. He loves you. You're bought at a price. The price was His only Son. You are valuable to Him. He claims you as a child. You're a child of the King. Somebody say, Amen. We are. We forget that. Ever doubt that or wonder about that? Remember the story about the old man. He was brought to the hospital emergency room late one evening, the parent mugging victim. He was the victim. But he looked like a homeless man. And he was ill-clothed and dirty and battered and he appeared to be unconscious. And one young medical student took one look at him and said, what in the world should we do with this worthless wretch? The old man opened his eyes slightly and in an amazing strong voice he said, call him not worthless for whom Christ died. And Christ died for all of us. He died for the person that's bitter and angry and does stuff that we don't like. He, he loves even the person that, that's been a murderer. Somebody that stole something from He loves them too. It's a child like that has done something wrong. And does a mother stop loving her child or does a father stop loving their son because they've done something wrong? And the answer is no. By the way, we... Went and saw the movie The Shack. Anybody seen The Shack? Pretty good. That's the story right there. God loves His children. Even the bad ones. Even when we've done wrong, He loves us. He has a plan for us. He has a hope for us. He has a promise for us. And you don't have to feel worthless. You're a child of the Most High God. You don't have to be at war with yourself. You don't, it doesn't have to be that way. You're special to God and it makes you supremely valuable to God. The second thing, you don't have to be at war with other people. Some people are at war with other people all the time. They just can't get along. They never figured out they might be the problem. Right? It doesn't have to be that way. 
In Mark 5, the legion, the madman, was very much at war with other people. He was, he was an outcast from society. He was chained. He was shackled. He is exiled in the tombs and constantly doing battle with other people. And here in this story, he runs towards Jesus and his disciple. He's looking for a fight. <laughs> he's ready to take on Jesus. And isn't it amazing how crossways and strange and hostile people can get? Several years ago, there, on 2020, they had a the program was called Neighbors at War. Neighbors at War. Showing how the next door neighbors do battle with one another, fighting one another, fussing one another, suing one another, sometimes even uh, shooting one another. Because of a barking dog, a, dozy, uh, a noisy power tool, a, a, a bouncing basketball. Eh, you might not like it about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, but you know. When will we ever learn? When will we ever learn to befriend one another, to respect one another, to love one another? Back on September the 5th, 1990, dear Abby had a column that said this. There's a city newspaper that had an article about a young man from a wealthy family who was about to graduate from high school. And it was custom that they, they, in the affluent neighborhood for the parents to give the graduate an automobile. And Bill and his father had spent months looking for cars. And it was the week before the graduation, they found the perfect car. Bill was certain that on graduation night, that car would be his. But after the graduation ceremonies, Bill's father handed him a gift-wrapped Bible. And Bill was furious. He threw the Bible down. He stormed out of the house. And his father never spoke to him. Or he and his father never spoke again. They never saw each other again. His parents tried to reach him, like parents do. But Bill refused to speak to them or see them or read the letters. And when his parents died... Bill came home, and he sat one night going through his father's possessions that he was going to inherit, and he came across this Bible his father had given him for graduation. And Bill brushed away the dust and opened the Bible, and he found a cashier's check dated the day of his graduation to the exact amount of the car they had both chosen. It's a pretty sad story. It's pitiful. It's tragic. Stuff like that happens all the time. When we give up on somebody. We don't make amends for what's going on. The anger, there's bitterness, there's missed opportunities. You know, we hope that Bill and many others would read the Bible cover to cover and find out something about forgiveness. And second chances. I don't know about you, I need some second chances in life. And I've had some second chances in life. You don't have to be at war with other people. It doesn't have to be that way. Thirdly and finally, you don't have to be at war with God. God sent His one and only Son. We don't have to be at war with God. Being at war with God is an act of rebellion. Been going on since the Garden of Eden. People just hadn't got a little smarter over the years. It happens every with every generation. And it doesn't have to be that way. In Mark chapter 5, the legion of the madman, is, he's cut off from God. In this case, he cut himself off from the Son of God. God's Son. What have you to do with me? Don't torment me. He says to Jesus. A story about a father playing with his young son one afternoon. They're playing in the front yard when the father accidentally he hits the boy in the face with his elbow. Sound like basketball to me. I don't know. It's a sharp blow full to his son's face. The little boy was stunned by the impact. He 
It hurt. It was just about to burst into tears. And then he looked into his father's eyes. And instead of anger and hostility, he saw there was father's, the father's sympathy and concern. And he saw there the father's love and compassion. And instead of exploding into tears, the little boy suddenly burst into laughter. What he saw in his father's eyes made all the difference. And this is the one reason Jesus is so important to us. He lets us look into the Father's eyes because He's the Son. He's the mediator. He's the brother, the go-between. When we look at Jesus, we see what God is like and what God wants us to be like. Jesus shows us the love and the compassion and the concern and the empathy in, in the Father's eyes that the good news of our Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus reveals God's look at us, not with anger, not with vengefulness, not condemning eyes, but with the eyes of love. And so we don't have to be at war with ourselves. We're a child of God. We don't have to be at war with other people. We can be at peace with other people in our life, in our family, in our neighbors, our co-workers, kids at school. We don't have to be at war with other people. And we don't have to be at war with God. Jesus comes into our lives just as he came into the Legion's life saying, it doesn't have to be this way. Amen? Amen.